Rachel, I did want to ask for your item. Are you going to be presenting or is it Andrea? Hello, everyone. Hello, you're invisible. <laughs> ah, I think uh, I had everyone muted. Can, can you, you hear, hear me? Okay. You can hear us. Just can't see you. I can't hear anything. One second. Andrea, I did want to ask really quick before we get started um, for your item. Are we going to are you going to be presenting your PowerPoint or will it be? Rachel. No, I do not have a PowerPoint. It's the memo. I'll talk about the memo and answer questions. OK, perfect. Thank you. Um, I'm still not getting any audio on my end. I'm going to re log in. On with WebEx. Okay, I'm back on and I'm not hearing any audio. You still can't hear anything? Testing? <laughs> Um, I'm working on that, but I'm not really sure. Yeah, it's weird. You can kind of see like, like a spot at a bunch of spots where your <laughs> bits <you> should be. <laughs> okay. I, I heard you back. Did you hear me? Oh, okay, you can hear us now. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. Um, right. I did try switching the audio, but maybe nobody was talking. I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah, so my camera has been not working, and this is what happened. So um, the camera is on. I even when I take off the virtual background, there's no no visual, and I can't seem to get a hold of IT to to fix that. So I'm just going to turn my video off, but just so you know, <laughs> me, <laughs> just the computer. Um, yeah. Alrighty, y'all, apologies for the technical difficulties. Um, we have our council members present and we have um, all of our staff that we need for the um, agenda. Yes, all staff and speakers are present. Wonderful. Alrighty, then we're going to go ahead and call the meeting to order. Um, first item of business is the approval of the August 9th or sorry, 4th meeting minutes. Um, I approve um, Councilor Medina Marcano. Do you have any changes? No changes. Awesome. So I think formally you are OK with approving them. Then. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> OK, great. Um, uh, do we have any announcements? Okay. Alrighty, then we'll move on to um, the content of our 
meeting uh, starting with the Aurora Housing Authority update. Thank you all. I'm going to share a PowerPoint that will be presented by three of our staff people, myself, Dana Ashley Ohm, Craig Moreshki, our executive director, and Steve Blackstock, who is the director of family services. So bear with me while I share. Thanks for having us. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to chat and obviously we want this to be a dialogue and get feedback um, from council and staff on any issues. We bring up today, so thanks for having us. So, um, go ahead, Dana. Yeah, so I, I think we're up and the next one. Yep. So, just some basics of the housing authority. So, uh, in Colorado, housing authorities are established either by cities or counties or partnerships thereof. So, we were established in 1975 by uh, council. We are separate from the city, um, obviously. So, we're quasi governmental. Um, we have seven um, members of our board of commissioners that are appointed by the mayor. Um, and I think the whole point of this presentation today, too, is the partnership we have with the city because they are a crucial partner in, in everything we do and we have good relationships with the city. So we're very appreciated to the staff and um, the council for all their support. So um, housing authorities, there are state statutes that we have to operate under. Um, so if you are interested, you can look up 294201 and all the good things that are under there as far as what we can and cannot do. So, as I mentioned, we are um, quasi-governmental. We're not a 501c3, we're uh, quasi-governmental um, under state statutes, kind of like a metro district or school district, that kind of thing. So, um, our primary focus is affordable rental housing. Um, we do not do home ownership. We've always kind of acquiesced to the city or other nonprofits that undertake um, home ownership activities, so we just focus on rental. Um, our operating budget right now is about $57 million. Um, we've done about, in, through 2017 to 2020, we did about um, $53 million of new construction. And then this, actually, this bullet point, we probably should have updated. Um, so for the next, I guess, 24 months, we're gonna do an additional $78 million of new construction on three properties, which we're going to talk about in a minute um, and add 200 and two, uh, 231 new units to that 810. So we have about 60 employees. Um, we serve about 2200 um, vouchers as well. So on top of that 810 units, we administer about 2200 um vouchers of, of various um flavors um and which we'll go through in a minute here and we're also very engaged in aurora at home which is the city's homeless uh program and plan so we'll talk steve will talk a little bit about that in a minute as well um just briefly on the housing choice voucher program um section eight as it's also known it's not an entitlement program like um uh, snap or unemployment compensation so you know unfortunately if you need it um it's not just an automatic um, housing choice vouchers are subject to congressional appropriations um and uh, so when those appropriations are made um, we respond to nofas which are notice of funding availabilities when they become available so there's a new one that's going to come out here um, in october we're going to respond to that um, it's primarily related to homeless. So as those opportunities become available, um, we'll try to be as aggressive as we can and, and go for those new vouchers. So um, right now we provide about $36 million in, in annual rental assistance to those 2,200 households. Um, and so there's special purpose vouchers under that program as well, under that 2,200. So just, just a few of them that we have under there, we have um, 137 HUD VASH, which are um, for formerly homeless veterans. Um, we're working with the city right now to make sure uh, through the Built for Zero campaign that all those vouchers are being used. Um, we have 72 mainstream vouchers. Those are non for non-elderly um, individuals that have disabilities. Um, and um, our newest vouchers are 74 um, EHVs or emergency homeless vouchers, and those are for homeless individuals. So we work through the Metro Denver Homeless Initiative continu continuum of care uh, to get those referrals. So, um, and we just did just the other day get 15 new vouchers, um, just kind of basic housing choice vouchers um, through the 2021 congressional appropriations. Those were the first new vouchers, just regular housing choice vouchers 
I think we've received in over 20 years. So aside from those special purpose vouchers that I just mentioned, um, which come out on occasion, um, but just kind of regular uh, housing choice vouchers, we generally don't get new ones. So again, we just got 15. Those will be coming online in the next few months. Um, who's assisted with those vouchers? Um, we serve about 5,900 total individuals in those 2,200 households. Um, you can see about half are, are children, uh, 40 some, and that 44% kind of varies, but right now it's around uh, 44% are senior or disabled or senior and disabled. Um, the average income with those vouchers is about you know, 12 to 13,000 a year. So you can see they're very low income individuals. Um, and the average rental assistance that we provide through that voucher is somewhere between 11 and 1200, depending on family size. Um, and so what happens is with our kind of regular housing choice vouchers, what we like to do when people, you know, people die, people um, are not on the program any, anymore through, you know, compliance issues, they could um, have income progression and they're not on the program. Um, so as our regular vouchers become available, um, what we try to do is give priority to individuals that are in various homeless programs to get those new housing choice vouchers. So, and we work with the city and nonprofits on that as well, primarily through Aurora at Home um, to give those vouchers to, to working with homeless individuals. So, um, and there's about a thousand uh, property owners or landlords that, that lease to our clients. Um, then those 810 units um, that we are the general partner, we're the owner and manager of those. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, Steve. Well, and there's an additional about 1500 units that we're a limited partner that we've partnered with either for profits or nonprofits on as well. So a few you may know is Path Providence at the Heights, um, Alameda View Apartments, which is across the street from the City Hall. Um, Range View Apartments is um, a big one out off of Colfax. So that just came online about a year ago. So there's a, a variety of nonprofit and for profits that we work with um, as well to help develop new rental housing. Um, you know, there's a variety, Dana is going to talk a little bit more about this, but you know, we, have, we use a variety of, of uh, funding sources, um, project based section eights. Um, low income housing tax credits is kind of the workhorse. Um, we have some resolution trust corporation units, home and CDBG are also uh, key funding gaps. So we use taxable and tax exempt bonds, private activity bonds are the primary tax exempt vehicle, which Dana's going to talk about. And we have about 48 million in outstanding debt on the properties. And we're going to add probably about 25 million um, when we add those new units um, in the next year. Um, our oldest building is Fletcher Gardens, which is an eight-story building up near Colfax. Um, that's a project-based Section 8 for family, uh, excuse me, for seniors. And our newest building is Peoria Crossing, which is at 30th and Peoria. Um, that's 82 units that opened up in 2019. And there's some, some other buildings we're going to be opening up here, which Dana will talk about as well. So um this is you know we're not going to go over all these but um uh, just kind of shows you where our buildings are they are spread across the city um all the way up north is walden apartments walden 35 um, we had our groundbreaking a few weeks ago on that that's up near gateway uh near 40th and tower on the north and all the way down to um ivy hill townhomes which is near parker and arapaho um, on the southern end of the city so you can see um the buildings that we have kind of kind of span the city from north to south the next slide just it's a little hard to see, but this shows those in the council wards um, and, and where those are located. So you can see again, it's north to south, kind of along the 225 spine, I would say primarily. Um, and I think I am gonna hand this over to Steve Blackstock, our Director of Family Services, uh, to talk a little bit about um, his activities and um, who lives on our properties and how we work with those residents. So, Steve, do you want to take it away? Yeah, yeah. thank you, Craig, and, and good morning. My name is Steve Blackstock. I'm a licensed clinical social worker and the director of family services here at Aurora Housing Authority. This slide is simply a snapshot of the residents who live on AHA properties. Uh, AHA houses over 1,700 household members. The average annual income of these households is $21,600. 40% of AHA residents are children, and 60% of AHA residents have incomes that fall below $20,000 a year. And you can see 
the racial breakdown on the slide there. I think beyond all those important numbers, what they do indicate and demonstrate is that uh, Aurora Housing Authority is serving and housing the most vulnerable and low income members of our community. And in the next two slides, we'll show how we're doing that in more detail. So Dana, next. So the Department of Family Services partners with individuals, families, and the community to foster a quality housing experience as residents strive toward housing stability and self-sufficiency. In this department, we have eight uh, uh, MSWs. Some are licensed, some are clinically licensed social workers, and they work with families in our homeless programs, and they work with residents on our properties. One social worker is dedicated solely to the work uh, in the, with veterans in the BASH program, which we partner uh, closely with the VA on. Two social workers work with 50 former foster youth and other families who are involved in child welfare uh, in the family unification program, which is a partnership with Arapahoe County. Funding from the city of Aurora, from Arapahoe County, uh, the DOH, uh, and the COC allow us to work with homeless families with children through our road home program, uh, which includes homeless prevention programs, rapid rehousing and permanent supportive housing. We do work closely with Aurora at Homes landlord recruiter to assist program participants locate suitable housing and I'll talk more about that in a minute. A little more than a year ago, AHA launched a resident services program called ECHO, which stands for education, community, health, and opportunity that brings community resources and programming to residents on nine AHA properties with plans to expand to other developments as they come online. In this area of our work, AHA was awarded a grant through the Youth Violence Prevention Program to fund family activities at the properties um, in order to build community and give youth uh, healthy and meaningful ways to spend their time we were also awarded a CIRCLE grant through the Department, Colorado Department of Human Services to provide early childhood education on three of our properties. You may have seen um, a news story on Nine News recently, just a couple of days ago about, about this happening at Willow Park, one of our properties. In addition to all this, we've hosted vaccine clinics, we distributed backpacks and school supplies, we've gathered residents for barbecues, sip and paint, uh, STEM classes for youth, gardening classes and we continue to work uh, to ensure that residents are engaged and invested in their communities. And on that last uh, bullet point on this slide, we are actively working to house families and individuals in the emergency housing voucher program. Next. So currently AHA is the plan administrator and the fiscal agent for Aurora at Home and we have taken an active role in the recent strategic planning process for the collaborative as we work together uh, to meet the needs of those experiencing homelessness in our community. At AHA specifically, we operate several programs within Aurora at Home. This year, we have served 63 families, including uh, 139 children. Uh, these are families who are, are literally homeless when they come to us. 91% um, of those families who have exited the program have exited into permanent housing this year, with 10 of those families receiving vouchers from Aurora Housing Authority. The landlord recruiter uh, helped us house um, 11 new families this year. There was carryover of families that were already in housing and case management from the last year, and so that's what accounts for what appears to be a lower number. In the last couple of weeks, we opened up referrals and are processing intakes and eligibility for new families. So that number will go up very soon. The recruiter has built relationships with property managers across and owners across the city. And she works closely with landlords uh, when rents aren't paid or there are unresolved maintenance issues or other concerns as they arise. And she does this kind of mitigation work so that we can keep returning to these property managers and their housing portfolios to house our homeless families uh, when they have openings in their portfolio. Uh, and she's significantly decreased the, the time that families spend in the housing search process so that they can be settled and, and feel at home as soon as possible. I'll turn it over to Dana now. Thank you, Steve. Um, so I'm just going to talk about development a little bit because this is an important arm of the Housing Authority. 
And we're trying to keep pace with the growing need for affordable housing. So we do this by um, competing with everyone else in the state of Colorado for the low income housing tax credits and also soft, uh, soft funds like home and CDBG that flow through the city or state. So the low income housing tax credit program was um, created in 1986, it sort of changed the landscape of how funding worked for affordable housing and created this whole new opportunity. Uh, the Colorado Housing and Finance Authority is the allocating agency for those tax credits. And so no matter what we're needing, whether it's a federal 9% credit, a straight 4% credit, or a state housing credit, um, we have to apply through CHAFA. So CHAFA is sort of the gatekeeper of all of these. They look at each application, make sure it meets their robust thresholds, and then awards um, based on readiness to proceed, um, um, geographic considerations and also, you know, quality of the candidate. So, um, you know, we're always sort of in that competition cycle. That federal 9% credit, um, states get a per capita allocation of $2.60 per person. So that's like 15.3 million in federal credits. So every year that's calculated, capped, and distributed by CHAFA. Um, there's also the straight 4% tax credit, which is also a federal tax credit. And this is sort of limited and linked to private activity activity bond volume cap, of which Aurora does receive about 21 million in PAB volume cap annually. Um, state housing credits, that's a program that added to this, it adds $10 million of state housing credits annually. And these are mixed and matched. So a lot of times people have a state housing credit that gets paired with a state 4% credit. So what I'm really trying to say is this is a very complex, um, but effective financing tool. And we have to develop expertise in this area in order to compete successfully. Um, Chaffa allocates these tax credits um, and then develop, uh, developers use them to sell the credits to corporations. So we call that tax credit investment. Um, you know, this last bullet here, I just wanted everyone to understand. So for the entire state in 2021, there were 13 deals that were awarded federal 9% credits, 23 deals that were straight 4% credits, and 13 deals that did this pairing of state and 4% credits. So that's 49 deals for an entire state where every community is vying for new affordable housing. Um, so kind of how it works, I just wanted to walk you through sort of the mathematical reality of it. And I'm using our um, Walden 35, which some of you are at the groundbreaking as my representative example here. So Chaffa allocated 1.74 million in 4% credits to Walden 35. So that credit is good for 10 years to the investor, which in our case happens to be Wells Fargo, and this directly offsets their corporate federal income taxes. So that's sort of their incentive to do this. So that 1.74 million multiplied by 10 years um, equates to about 17.4 million in market value to that investor. So the investor looks at what, um, you know, the local market looks like, looks at what they're willing to um, buy those credits for. And in our case, Wells Fargo offered 95 cents per credit. So you take that 95 cents by that value of 17.4. And to our project, we got about 16.5 million in equity um, to help build Walden 35. And so what that looks like in um, you know, a deal, you can see those funding sources. So overall, our project is costing us almost $37 million to build. We're getting a first mortgage from Wells Fargo for 12.6 million. But then if you scroll down to that fourth uh, line item there, that's the tax credit equity. So that 16.5 million in equity is what allows us to charge lower rents. And so if you look at the affordability distribution that we have at Walden 35, we're deploying something called income averaging, which means we can serve people in the community who earn 30% of area median income. And those folks for a two bedroom apartment would pay $697 monthly for a rent, which we all know is an amazing deal in this particular market. 
Conversely, we're going to have folks who earn up to 70% of area median income, and those folks would pay closer to $1,600 for a two-bedroom apartment rent. So the rents are sort of scaled in accordance with their income. We're serving folks who earn very low incomes, just folks who earn, you know, pretty good service sector wages in an area that has a lot of those kinds of jobs. And so we're, you know, excited about using this um, this particular tool to meet more of the need because typically if you just do a 4% deal, everything gets clustered around that 60% AMI and you don't get to serve the range of people who really do live in your community. People make all sorts of incomes. And so um, just wanted to kind of explain how that tax credit equity um, translates into lower rents for our tenants. Um, and then wanted to talk to you a bit more about our development pipeline. So we have um, four deals in the works. Um, I alluded to the fact that it's very competitive to apply for tax credits and Liberty View, which is our senior veterans project with 59 units. We actually had to apply to Chaffa three times to get awarded state plus 4% tax credit. So we finally um, were successful in 2020. And I'm happy to say that our construction will be completed um, here in November of 2022, and we'll start leasing up just in time for uh, the holidays, which is a tough time to move, but um, also just we're so uh, grateful we have something to celebrate around the holidays and the opening of this. Um, Peoria Crossing phase two then, um, we went back in in 2021 and applied for tax credits and were awarded uh, tax credits for Peoria two. So we felt very good about back-to-back -back applications. And then Walden 35, as it's a straight 4% deal, we were also able to apply for in 2021. So we're trying to be as aggressive as possible. We're trying to educate Chaffa about the needs in Aurora. And at one point, um, they sort of had this unwritten uh, policy that Aurora got one award of tax credits in any competitive cycle a year. And we went back um, and talked to them about the basically the infrastructure that's in place, all of the developers who are here in Aurora who are able to build affordable housing and the growing need in uh, Colorado's third largest city. So we've really advocated for more investment to be placed in Aurora and we've seen that um, come to fruition in the last few cycles. Um, the last project we're working on is a uh, it's a permanent supportive housing project in partnership with Aurora Mental Health as they develop their Potomac campus. And our intention there is to apply for a 9% tax credit award this February and build about 40 units of permanent supportive housing. So this would be working very closely with Steve Blackstock's team because we're gonna need to provide a much more robust level of case management services to those folks because those are folks coming off the street. We're gonna be stabilizing them in housing and they are going to be those who have been accessing services through Aurora Mental Health, either through mental health services or substance abuse services. So we're really um, excited about this ambitious project and learning as much as we can to move forward on that. Um, so I thought I'd end with pictures because that's more fun than listening to people talk. And as Craig mentioned, in 2019, we opened Peoria Crossing, which is a beautiful development at 30th and Peoria. So this is 82 units of one, two, and three bedroom. Um, housing for um, the community and we're in the process of expanding um, on the campus and adding an additional 72 units. And then Village at Westerly Creek, um, this opened in 2000, I want to say 18, um, but this is this has been sort of a three part development in the city. Um, Village at Westerly Creek one and two were seniors exclusively and three included family housing, but um, some additional senior housing. And um, just to kind of talk about, you know, Steve talked about serving diverse and, you know, vulnerable populations in the community. And I feel like these community gardens really express the diversity of the community we serve. Uh, they are the most um, 
interesting and varied gardens, uh, I would argue, in Aurora um, in terms of where people come from and what their cultural heritage is bring brought to these community gardens is really a testament to the to the growth um, that can come from the security of housing. So thank you very much for letting us present today. Um, we so appreciate our partnership with the city and the staff as we um, all try to tackle the issues around affordable housing in our community. Thank you all for the presentation. Uh, we think we always enjoy getting updates from our housing authority. I'm going to open it up to our committee members if you have any questions. Uh, I do, Councilmember Morio. Go ahead, Councilmember Medina. Uh, yes, a question I had that somebody had asked me is like, what is the wait list? How long is the wait list to get into one of these uh, complexes? So a good question. So it depends. So, um, so on our voucher, our housing choice voucher program, um, we open the wait list when we have vouchers available and, you know, I wish we could open it all the time. So, as I mentioned, um, we're going to get 15 new, uh, housing choice vouchers. Those will probably come on late line late this year. So with those, we would post a notice and we would um, open that wait list. People have to get on the wait list. And then, um, you know, it's how many we would take on that wait list for 15, I, 15, I don't know. It would probably be maybe around 100. Um, and then we would process those um, individuals to get those 15 uh, vouchers as an example. So that wait list for vouchers, you know, it comes and goes when, um, you know, we can fill those vouchers. I wish it was a simpler process, but unfortunately we're mandated to do a wait list and then we take people off the wait list. For our properties um, that we open, um, such as Dana showed, uh, Peoria Crossing, we're going to be opening that in 2023, I think late, or um, Walton 35 Gateway, what we do on those because they're not there's primarily there's not section eight vouchers in there so it's it's not really a technical wait list it's more when we have when we start the lease up on the property about three months before we open it and dana you can jump in and help me on this um we take interest people that are interested to move in um and then our staff starts going through that list of interested uh, parties to lease up and then you know when the building's leased then people leave or you know whatever um they go to the property directly so dana i don't know if you want to talk just quickly about you know how we do the lease up on new buildings yeah, it's it's very much like uh, any new building, right? The tax credit program is really income based. So as long as you're within those income thresholds, you can apply to live there. So like Liberty View, we're starting to talk to veterans and um, families now and get them on a wait list because we want people to start giving us, you know, their information so we can say, yes, you're qualified to live in here. So as each of these open up about three months before we think we'll get our TCO, which is our temporary certificate of occupancy, um, you know, we want to have a robust pipeline of folks coming in. And then, you know, once we open the buildings, it usually takes two to three months to actually, you know, fully lease a building. Um, so I would say it's kind of a six month process, three months before, three months after, in which folks can go to a new development and, you know, get on that list or or just apply like you would um, any other apartment. So that's kind of how that works. And then um, when we have vouchers associated with a project, there's a wait list that opens up kind of in a, in the same time frame. So three months before we'd start opening up a wait list. And now you know, to follow up on that question. So people on the wait list, do they are they there permanently or how does that work? Do they get slated? Why yeah, what? Year. Yeah, good question. And, and I appreciate it's a bureaucratic process, but a lot of this is mandated by HUD, how we do these wait lists. But yeah, we'll keep them on the wait list. I mean, you know, back in the day, several years ago, we would keep, we would take the wait list and then keep those people on it for years. What us and a lot of other housing, housing authorities are doing, because that's not really fair, right? If you're on a wait list for 10 years, that's kind of nutty. Um, so what we're, we're trying to do is to you know, if we have a specific number of vouchers available, open the wait list, then close it. And then after a certain time, say maybe 12 months, we would, uh, you'd go off the wait list. So we would kind of wipe it clean again. And then, um, you know, when the vouchers become available, we would reopen the wait list 
you know, in a year or two um, kind of thing. So, I mean, you could, you know, there's two sides to that coin, obviously. You could say, well, hey, I was on that wait list, you know, two years ago, but do we want people on a wait list for 10 years? Um, it's, you know, there, I, I don't think there's a perfect answer to it, but, um, you know, we're trying to be as flexible as we can with opening those wait lists um, to serve people. I, you know, we appreciate it. There's a huge demand and we wish we could serve everybody. Thank you. Councilmember Member Marcano, do you have any questions? I do. Thank you, Councilmember Member Murillo. Um, and I want to thank you all for the presentation. Um, and my question um, is this. What can we do as a city um, to help the authority as it stands today um, be able to build more housing? We have a lot of information um, in terms of what the market demands are for various income ranges, um, but we're not building nearly enough uh, through the housing authority currently, and I'm not blaming you all for that because I understand, you know, the federal uh, government has a big role to play here. Um, but we're not building nearly enough to keep up with that demand. Um, and I get messages from folks all over the city and in Ward 4 um, who are scared of being priced out and being made homeless. So what can we do um, in the short term? So, I mean, I... I guess I'll go from low hanging fruit to high hang high hanging fruit. So um, I think processes are important. So I just met this morning with Laura Perry um, to talk about um, the review process and how um, we can work more cooperatively with the city on that. So when we have, we talked about these new buildings that we can streamline um, the development review process as, you know, time is money. And I know you all hear that from, from any developer, whether it's affordable housing or luxury home builders. So, um, I, you know, I think the partnership, and I'm not just blowing smoke, um, I think we have a good partnership with the city. Um, and the city's willing to listen. Again, I had a very fruitful discussion with Laura this morning, um, and I know she's working on some things and she's prioritized um, when we have issues. Um, you know, Jacob Cox is great with the Office of Development Assistance. Um, you know, we had issues trying to close Walden 35. So I think processes, um, I know Janine and her staff, she's assigned a planner to specifically work. Um, Liz um, from her staff, I can't remember her last name, I apologize, but we have a planner assigned to us now. Um, and these might seem like small things, but in the big scope, when we're trying to get a deal done and, and built and occupied, they're huge to have that relationship. Um, you know, not every city has that relationship with the housing authority. So I think processes are important. Um, uh, and then land. Um, you know, we talked to Jessica a little bit about this as well. So, I mean, we have brokers that are looking for dirt for us right now. Mm -hmm. um, so I think working with the city on to find land, um, you know, we could do a whole session on what's coming from the state of Colorado. And in a nutshell, there's about half a billion dollars that's going to be coming from the state of Colorado starting in the fall for new affordable housing, as well as housing um, for those that have mental health and substance abuse issues. So I think as a city and the housing authority, we can work together more on trying to plan where, you know, a half a billion to put that in perspective. I think three or four years ago, the state division of housing maybe handed out 30 or $40 million. So to go from 30 or 40 million to half a billion dollars, mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, you know, it's crazy. So um, crazy good, but I think, you know, we have to have our ducks in a row and work with the city to plan. Um, and we're not gonna do all that, I get it. You know, there's for-profit developers and non-profit developers that are gonna fill that void. But I think us working with the city to identify land parcels that we could, we could, cause you know, you hear the term shovel ready. So I mm -hmm. think we need to identify sites. Um, Dana li listed those new deals that we're working on, but we need more dirt. So we're trying to find land um, that would be huge. And then money. So, um, you know, and again, Dana showed um, on a, out of that $37 million, help me, Dana, what's the number in at tax credit equity? What was that number? 16. Okay, so $16 million of that is essentially a grant. You know, I appreciate there's a lot of imaginations there on how these credits work, but at the end of the day, out of that 36 million, 16 million was a grant. So how do we work um, to access funds, both through the state and then, um, you know, I know the city has funding as well. So, I, you know, again, I think it's process, working cooperatively and money because um, that's, you know, the marketplace isn't providing affordable housing. So I think it's those, I guess it's a three-legged stool in my mind. So I don't know, Steve and uh, Dana, if you want to jump in on other ways um, the city can help us. 
Yeah, I think I'll just follow up. I and mean, I think Jessica and her team have really tried to be creative about what else you can bring, because I think our biggest detriment when we go in for a competitive tax credit application with JAPA is we're competing against Denver and Boulder, right? Mm -hmm. And Denver and Boulder have bond programs, have general fund dollars, have, you know, different resources that they've deployed so that they just have more to bring to bear to both individual developments and to that conversation about, you know, matching funds and local commitment. Now, that being said, you know, I think I always uh, feel like I'm able to make a very strong case about how Aurora supports us. So I never feel like there's a question about whether Aurora is supporting, but I just look at the landscape across the metro area and what some jurisdictions have been able to do, and that's what we're competing against. And so, you know, anytime you bring more local resources, you're going to have more clout there. Um, and then, I, you know, I think that we're always trying to figure out who to partner with. I think, you know, there's been some very creative partnerships between the faith community and affor affordable housing nonprofit developers. And I don't see that uh, trending any other way. I think that, you know, is an extension of their mission and doing good in the community. And I think we're looking for other, you know, folks who might have land and, you know, we've always tried to think about ways to partner with other entities, whether it be, you know, school districts or the city who might have, you know, land that they're underutilizing. So, you know, just thinking about non traditional ways other than just competing in the market because the market's so hot right now. You know, even when we do look at buildings to buy and maybe rehab, um, you know, we're competing with somebody who has a cash offer who can come in and do something very quickly, you know, for maybe more than we'd be comfortable spending because we just are, you know, we're trying to be judicious with our resources and maximize them. So those are just some ideas as well. And uh, Councilmember Marcano, I was going to jump in. On that point, you know, we kind of stepped back on trying to buy new buildings just because the market was, as Dana said, cash offers like 60 mm -hmm. days to close on a $40 million asset. I mean, that is, you know, that is some aggressive capital. Um, and so, you know, there could be ways I think we could explore, um, you know, to your point of, of um, constituents that are getting priced out of the market. Could the city and the housing authority look at ways, um, perhaps a line of credit? Um, we did this once before I got here. Um, where the city provided what was called a moral obligation. Basically, um, it was to buy some land, and we did. We bought Pier the land that Peoria Crossing sits on. Um, and it was the moral obligation, um, and city attorney's office could weigh on this in on this a lot better than I could, but basically, if the housing authority defaulted on the loan, the city would come up and make good on that loan. And fortunately, that never happened. But maybe there's ways we can explore lines of credit um, you know, to, to buy buildings, because I think, you know, as far as, you know, building new units, as we said, I mean, it takes, you know, if you give us a piece of land today, you know, it probably take three or four years to move people into that. But, um, sure. you know, I think it would be good for us to explore ways that we could possibly purchase some units. Um, and so we could compete in the market, which, again, is super aggressive. But um, and Steve, do you, you want to jump in? Um, you know, you're primarily work less working on the homeless issues with the city. Yeah, we have a really good partnership uh, with uh, with the city on in the Aurora at Home programs. Um, it, I was just going to jump in on the the resident services side too. We we partner with the city, as I mentioned, around the youth violence prevention, and so just having uh, more opportunities to to seek out how uh, we can work together to support the residents, um, and and then trying to house. Uh, the folks who are on the streets right now as much as possible, but those are pretty good relationships and however well, however we can continue to build those is, is going to benefit everybody. And I was just going to say one last thing. I know I'll be going to Houston with a number of the council members and other people. I think Aurora at home, which, you know, we didn't specifically talk a lot about today. Um, you know, Jessica and her team um, and Roberto have supported Aurora at home. And I think we have a good framework in place. I think we need to, you know, we're talking about scaling that up, but I think, um, you know, just kind of hitting again on that partnership things issue. We we have a lot of good framework and dialogue in place, um, and we're serving people. Obviously, it's not enough through the homeless programs, but I think we have a good framework in place. So as we you know explore what home what Houston is doing and, and other areas, I think building on the relationships and that framework we have in place with you know the city, the housing authority, and the nonprofits um, is going to be key because we don't need to reinvent the wheel. I think. The wheels in place. We just may, need to make it be bigger and faster. All right. Thank you all. 
Um, Councilmember Marcano, you uh, stole my thunder a little bit, but I, I really <laughs> appreciated your question. Um, uh, I will frame my questions a little bit differently, uh, but I, I think it's no surprise to anyone on this call or has been part of this committee that you know housing is a big priority in the city and and for me personally um so i guess my my question is um you i'm going to focus initially on one of the the you talked about land acquisition about being a way to potentially start getting creative and um, the city's being able to support that process. Uh, it is built into our housing strategy to um, engage in land acquisition. Um, so perhaps it's, I don't know who this question goes to, but I'm curious, you know, what, what um, would we as a city need to do internally to maybe channel some of our land acquisition strategies um, or to channel city resources to support with that particular strategy um, to support the uh, housing authority or really any of the strategies mentioned that align with our current housing strategy? Uh, good question. I mean, I think Jessica and I talked briefly the other day. I know the city's trying to um, exploring some opportunities. Um, I think trying to just get an, it, and I know the city's done this, but I don't, I don't think there's any city owned land that's laying around. I could be wrong, but I think one is trying to use the market, obviously um, trying to inventory parcels. And fortunately, I think, cause I, I just the other day, I was driving near six in the airport and there's a sign about a billboard, right? So I think it's going to take some, a little bit of legwork because the brokers really for us and Jessica, you can jump in. We, we haven't found anything lately. Um, so I think just some legwork and working with brokers to um identify uh, um available parcels and then i think the other thing um is when you you all have whether they're annexations or uh big development plans uh right now we're talking um with dana help me um the, the wind property Windler, yeah. yep down provo so you know obviously a lot of our, our what we're doing is focus more in the kind of the central part of the city but you know, this issue isn't going away as far as affordable housing. So um, Don Provost and his team have been very generous. We're, they've identified a parcel for us out there. Um, so I think, you know, obviously there's infill, but then there's longer term looking at um, as the city gets development permits in, is there a way that land could be set aside for affordable housing? And again, it's not going to be always us. You have Habitat, other nonprofits, but I think, you know, setting aside, we can work with the city to try to identify those opportunities as well um as as far as in addition to the the infill parcels so gotcha um i don't know jessica or staff if you um also wanted to to answer or comment on the question sure so council members you know craig's correct uh we in the housing strategy have a robust uh strategy around a land acquisition and land inventory um, I would say uh, Hector Reynoso and the team with Real Property has been hugely helpful in that process, um, not only looking at city-owned land opportunities, um, which we have two pieces of city-owned land identified to go through um, an RFP process, hopefully very soon. One of them um, we've done a lot of legwork on and should be ready to do that this fall. Um, so not just the city owned land pieces, um, but also just actively looking at the market. And so um, Hector has routinely been running reports. Um, we've been looking, you know, to kind of hone in our parameters and we've really gotten there where we need, you know, a certain number of acres with certain amount of access with certain amount of, you know, contiguity to other types of services. Those are the things that are going to help us score well in the CHAPA applications and things like that. Um, so, you know, I think continuing a lot of those efforts, continuing conversations with uh, folks like the school district as they look at what, you know, they're looking to do with the disposal um, or partnership with some of their pieces of land. Faith-based is very key. Um, Restoration Christian Ministries is recently uh, put in uh, for uh, some property that they own um, just north of where we have our safe outdoor space. Um, and so really getting creative and you know, looking beyond those pieces of what city owned land, but where we can have partnerships, where we can do ground lease agreements, where the housing authority can, you know, uh, be a partner in some of those deals that are beyond just what, um, you know, they may own and operate um, to sort of spread that out. And then agreed with Craig on the, the new development, because 
we really want to make sure that affordable is distributed throughout the city. Yeah, I agree. I, I don't think one district or area should have the a concentration of um, particular types of um, income based housing. I do think that that's something um, that should be spread around as well. Um, thank you. I appreciate that. I, I have several more, but I'm not sure it's going to be super helpful um, in this meeting. So perhaps I can follow up with staff and, and Craig um, after after the fact. Um, but I do think um, I don't know. I feel a sense of there there can be i think there's just so much alignment um and potential um ways to partner with um the housing authority and the city um you know i i think of um you know condemned properties or nuisance properties that we often struggle um as a city um to address um i know at my last town hall um there's a a nuisance motel um specifically um that um has been um the that the police department's working with a property owner um specifically on the crime piece but to zoom out a little bit you know what happens if that property um you know something happens to that property um it's not worth it to the owner to continue operating or it just goes for, so down the line in the um realm of like issues with with crime i guess i wonder if um that's something we can explore in the future i know we've talked about kind of softly uh, like a motel redevelopment strategy largely um as well um and i wonder if that's the type of partnership we could continue to explore but um you know all of those are just potential ideas i'd love to follow up with um you know craig and jessica after the conversation so we can um maybe vet that out a little bit more and we definitely look forward to those discussions so please don't hesitate to contact us. So yes, we'd very much be interested in that. Great, Alrighty. I think um, if we are all wrapped up, we can move on to our next agenda item. Thank you all for your time and your presentation. All righty, um, next agenda item is uh, city land um, and buildings in the um, arts district. Um, and I, I believe, is that, is that a presentation from you, Andrea? Yes. All righty, take it away. And in, and in the, um, the interest of time, I will try to be brief, but please uh, feel free to ask any questions that you might have. Um, so generally the, um, strategy for redevelopment in the arts district began in like two, you know, the late. 1990s, 2000, and um, included um, the development of the Fletcher Plaza Urban Renewal Plan, which is, um, you know, which basically is now known as the Arts District. There are three major components of this plan, and the plan was attached to your backup. It's kind of lengthy, but it focused on building a civic and cultural core. Uh, supporting the arts and developing urban residential and new retail space. Um, there were a number of activities that took place um, from 2000 to 2007, um, including building the Martin Luther King Library, uh, creating the arts district and supporting arts organizations and individuals, such as the East End Arts District, which later became um, the ACAD organization, um, there were some arts district loan funds, and there were a number of, um, activities that were started in Fletcher Plaza, et cetera, that supported this overall strategy that was carried on by numerous departments, not just, um, development services, because at that time it was a department. Um, and, you know, it included housing and community development. It included um, an organization known as Original Aurora New Renewal, which no longer exists, but was very aligned with um, the police department. Um, the third leg of the stool is uh, urban residential and new retail development. And um, 
Fletcher Gardens and Trolley Apartments, which um, are owned by the Aurora Housing Authority, were part of that initiative, including things like CDBG facade grants, helping retail buildings along Colfax Corridor. Um, in 2012, City Council um, asked, asked staff to revive to relook at that strategy that we had in place and this was um, so staff condun conducted extensive public outreach to update and determine priorities in the area of the colfax corridor so it was the corridor um, that went basically from yosemite to two to 225 and um, the arts district is a big part of that and um, that outreach resulted in um, reconfirming the public citing priorities in developing arts and entertainment uses and jobs and economic development as their highest priorities followed closely by reducing poverty, increasing cleanliness and safety. And following that study, um, the uh, city amended the Fletcher Plaza urban renewal plan and while it didn't change the overall goals or strategy, there were a few new objectives and things were updated to bring that strategy more current. So that's currently the strategy that um, development services and some of the other agencies tend to work with in regard to uh, developing in that area. And so the, um, Councilmember Murillo had questions about city owned property and uh, buildings that we own in the district. And um, so I've included a section on that with some history and some options. So um, we have seven buildings that I described within the memo, including the Fox Theater, um, which used to be a movie theater and the city purchased this building and renovated it for staff productions. It's run by library and cultural services. It has a budget for its operations and staff. Um, the second property is 144345 Elmira, which was originally leased to Catholic Charities. And um, then um, when, um, and it was run as a charitable donation center and, um, when Catholic charities, um, decided not to use that building any longer, um, the deed restriction, it reverted back to the city. Um, in, uh, 2012, when we were working on a lot of commercial projects, we initially thought we would like to use that, you know, for retail use, um, but that project didn't come through. And so at that point in time, based on its residential character, we've actually um, returned the building to um, housing and community development to make sure um, to see if they can um, use the building for low and moderate income residential, because it is kind of residential in character. Um, and they conducted a charrette for design. Um, they'll demolish the property and then try to find a developer for that use. Um, and that was one of the properties I believe that um, Jessica um, talked about in terms of city owned property being used for low and moderate income development. Um, the next property is the Hornbine building, which is a former library and it's a historic building named for its designer. When that building, um, the, when the MLK library was built, um, that building, um, was, uh, put out for RFP. We chose to lease it because it's historic, because of its historic nature. It's a really lovely building. And um, it went to um, Red Delicious Press, which is a printmaking collaborative. And um, it's one of the original efforts to bring arts into the, into the district. They've been in that building for all this time. 
um, and they are fairly active. They have renewed leadership that is working very closely. And for example, they were responsible for bringing um, Mo Print, which is a regional printmaking exhibit, um, to Aurora and hosting a hosting stuff at the both at the building at the Hornbein building, but also in um, the People's Building. There was a large exhibit there, which I believe was very successful. Um, another building that is owned by the city is 1468 Dayton Street. Now it's known as the Vintage Theater. Um, this building was purchased privately by a developer who received uh, an arts district loan in 2007 to turn the building into a theater. It had formerly been just a, like a, con a commercial building. Um, it was originally leased to Shadow Theater. Uh, they went out of business and in terms of the arts district loan, there were specific requirements that the building needed to stay a theater. And so um, when Shadow Theater went out of business for a while, um, they have reopened in, under a different name um, and, and have moved into Denver. Um, Vintage Theater purchased the building from the owner um, and um, the owner guaranteed the building. Later, um, when Vintage Theater defaulted as a way of saving the arts use in the building, um, the city purchased the building from the bank and retained Vintage as a tenant to keep the arts use. Um, the Vintage ha has always wanted to own that building and um, they have requested us to um, buy the building back. We would not sell it for less than what we paid for it. So we're trying to determine if they have the financial capability and if there's an arrangement that that might work for them. Um, the other building that we own is the People's Building at 9995 Colfax Avenue. This was formerly um, a People's Rent to Own. So we have a tendency of naming the buildings after former users and, um, and uh, designers of the buildings. But so we call that the People's Building. We purchased it uh, specifically with the intent of re renovating the space as a multi-use arts facility. Um, the city spent through its capital allocation program, spent two and a half million dollars purchasing and then renovating the space into its current mixed use building. Um, this this um, building has been managed under contract um, very successfully in 2019, the venue hosted um, 211 events and 9,300 visitors. Um, during the pandemic, the uh, curator worked to uh, pivot its use and op started opening the building virtually, doing a lot of virtual exhibits that could be viewed online without coming out. And so we had a total of 8,400 visits um, and 165 separate events um, during the pandemic in 2020. Um, in 2021, we had um, 8,500 um, uh, visitors and approximately 21,000 virtual visitors. So this this strategy has been really successful and we had like 270 events. So if you include all those, we're way we're above where we were in 2019. Um, so the city's ownership and management and subsidy make 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 this venue really one of the most cost effective venues for artists. Um, in the regional area. And so we are almost, I am told we are almost fully booked for 2023. And it allows us to offer subsidies 
to um, Aurora artists and groups because we give them a discount um, on terms of renting the space and creating opportunities for them to be regionally viewed as well. Um, we have two more buildings that um, who have good potential for uh, disposition. The first being the Music City building, which I believe was, um, it was acquired, I think, by eminent domain as part of the live when we built the library, it was part of the real estate that we needed to build the library and um, after the library was built, it was leased by real property for approximately 15 years to a um, piano and organ dealer music city. Um, so, um. The tenant vacated the building in about 2018 and and we explored whether or not the building could be. Um, redeveloped for a more active use that was consistent with the overall strategy for the area. So we were thinking retail or very active arts uses galleries, things like that. And, um. So, at that time, we had a. Um, a contractor go through the building and at that time in 2018 the cost to renovate that building and bring it it's in really bad shape um it was like seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars we think that now that's over a million probably and um we didn't have any funds available for doing that so during the pandemic we worked with the wend foundation which is part of the Walton Family Foundation. And um, you may know them because they were the original funder of the Help Kitchen project that we did. They showed a lot, they had a, re, a redevelopment function as part of their mission. And so they expressed interest in funding a redevelopment of that building. And so we worked with them, but then after the pandemic, some of their direction changed. Um, and they actually uh, left Aurora earlier this year. So we have been trying to cultivate other financially capable developers who would develop the property consistent with the area. We have a couple that we're working with, um, but I think staff believes that um, uh, we could we could issue an RFP. We want to we want to stimulate more new interest in the building, we could issue an RFP for sale or lease of the space for some of the uses we've talked about before, because what we're trying to do is bring activity into the core of downtown. It makes it safer. Um, it meets the public's goals of creating a core, civic core um, that's vibrant and so forth. Um, and it's right on our 50 yard line. So, um, we'd like to put that out for RFP sometime in the future um, with some, some of those parameters that we, what, what we'd like to see it used for. We think the building's worth between, as is, like not improved, somewhere between like three or 400, that 350, 400,000 and 600,000, even in its current condition because buildings in this area are selling for well over a million dollars. And um, so that's what we will we'll confirm that um, when we put it out, but those would be parameters that we'd like to have it either purchased or, um, or leased for something that's consistent with the overall strategy. And finally, um, the, the, there's the building at 1400 Dallas Street, known as the uh, 1400 Dallas Street Art Center and Gallery. This building was one of the first that was actually used to support the strategy. So when it was a District 1 station, and when um, the MLK Library was built, um, and development started at the Fitzsimmons campus, the, 
um, the district office, I moved onto the campus and there's a satellite within the MLK library that the police department currently uses. Um, the building was sold um, for a dollar after an RFP to an organization known as the Other Side Arts. And they, so it was consistent with the strategy and they took an arts district loan from the city to build, to, to renovate the space for use as an arts district, uh, a, an arts studio building and um, gallery space. And then they worked with artists and built their capacity and so forth. Um, later on, um, they had some difficulty uh, effectively managing and staffing the building and they approached the city and asked if they could sell the building. And rather than lose the asset, um, the city offered, because they were pretty defaulted on their arts district loan, we said that we'd settle the loan, but they could they could give us back the building. And so um, we issued another RFP and that was awarded to the Aurora Cultural Arts District Organization at the end of 2013. Um, ACAD managed that building. Um, they had a, a five year lease term, which ended in 2019. Um, and they had, they hired an executive director, which we worked with them to help fund so that they would have an opportunity to build capacity for that. Um, and they had some difficulty managing the building um, for the, at, during that time. And so um, at the end of the lease, the city decided to make some necessary repairs to the building and we during that time period so we just completed fairly recently um $180,000 worth of renovations to the building and we are currently in the process of bringing um artists who had been in residence before we vacated the building to do the renovations back into the building um we've uh, sent out temporary rental agreements with the objective of um, stabilizing the building occupancy and completing, we've been successful in getting another grant for a matching amount of $180,000 using what we've already put into the building as our match for that. So um, we have another round of renovations that we could make. And so we'd like to complete those and then um, put the, uh, we, we could put the building out for RFP to manage the space in a manage or um, sell the space for something consistent with, um, consistent with the overall goal of trying to incubate artists and grow their capacity to move into other privately owned spaces um, that they can rent or own, et cetera, for that. So we're trying to build artist capacity and um, a, you know, a larger strategy of incubating and subsidizing art space um, while building more space that could be privately owned and operated um, and bring more critical mass to the area. So those are the buildings um, that we've decided that's the stress of that that we own that have been dedicated to uh, the overall strategy of redevelopment up and until this point, um, and our suggestions for um, disposing of a couple of them, uh, you know, in the near future. Um, and I'd ask if. Council has any questions about that or the direction and um, the disposition of of what council would like to do with this information? Thanks, Andrea. Um, I have a couple of questions, uh, but 
Uh, so I'll, I'll ask a few and then also open it up to my colleagues um, as well. Um, so I was curious if you had a timeline on um, there. I think there were two properties that um, the city is open to disposition. Um, do you have a timeline on what that looks like? Um, so on the 1400 Dallas Street, what we'd like to do, we could if the if the council overall wants to dispose of it, we'd recommend finishing the renovations because we kind of need to make sure that we have the ability to make the renovations in the spaces. So some of them are going to involve some of improvements to some of the studio spaces. There's um, some windows and electric that we want to do there's energy efficiency things that are part of the grant that we've received. So once that's finished, and I think we could do that, we could put the property out. Let roughly say maybe the beginning of uh, 2023 for RFP and we could. Um, we could probably be ready by within you know six months to dispose of it if we have a successful RFP process, find folks and so on and so forth. And that's a fairly public process. Um, so, um, and that we'd need to make some decisions about um, whether or not we want to sell the building or just, um, put out the management of the building. Okay, those are decisions that have not been made. And so those would require some policy discussion on how, how we wanna do that. The second building, so I would say um, within the next 12 months, we could be the, we could be ready to dispose of the building in some way, shape or form. We could start that process, putting out the RFP in the beginning of 2023 and um, changing the disposition by mid-year 2023, okay? Um, for, because I've done a couple of these, I mean, it took us two rounds to do an RFP for the, um, the fanfare site, you know, and it, and it can take a while through the, the process. So a year is probably my guess on that. Um, for the um, for the Music City building, um, we can begin the process on that. We want to update or have pr better information, I think, on what we think it's going to take to maybe even white box that building. Um, Perhaps we want to do a little more study. We'd have to decide if we want to sell the building and what kind of parameters we put on it. But that could also that RFP could also go out um, at the beginning of the year, and we could see what we can get. Because there are a couple of ways that we could structure a sale or a partnership to develop that building. You know, things like. Um, we would be more generous on the price if a developer were to come in and make all the improvements privately. For example, if we wanted to sell the building, perhaps we subsidize the purchase price so the developer spends all their money making the building habitable and that's gonna require some policy direction as well for uh, what we wanna see in terms of the specific uh, uses and um, financial capabilities of the developer. Gotcha. Question. Um, yes, it did. I, I have a follow up. So I think for both of those buildings, um, at, at what point would there, it sounds like there's some options. I guess I'm unclear on, and there were some decisions that haven't been made yet and potentially implications for policy through council. Like at what point does that, um, does that happen? So it sounds like at least my understanding for 1400 Dallas is that 
either way, yeah, the the city would want to finish renovations before anything happens. Like whether we decide to um, contract the management or to sell, and then Music City sounds like we're that 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 isn't necessarily the case. So I guess at what point does council get in, engaged in in these conversations? Well, that, that's I. It's my understanding that that's kind of the purpose of this. So we could have some more specific discussions around the disposition of these two buildings, if you'd like, in terms of what's the, you know, the staff has recommendations and it's a question of, uh, do you, um, do you as the policy committee, um, want uh you know want further discussion of those policy options and um further discussion or are you uh satisfied with the overall staff recommendation um we there when you lease the facility we could to get the most bang for our buck we could do both actually and put it out we can ask for proposals on management so you do a request you can do a request for qualifications and say the intent is to either lease out the management of the building and have people submit proposals for both buying the building or leasing you know or leasing the building for the management of it and have them provide that sort of information. And then a committee can be put together to review those specific with council um, information. So we could have further discussions either in this committee or in the horns committee about how council generally wants to dispose of the buildings um, and get a little more direction if there's specific direction to have. Gotcha, okay. Um, I appreciate that. Um, uh, I definitely think there's a question for this committee here. Um, I'll ask, I think, um, uh, yeah, so I want to, I want to make sure we're, um, cognizant of other council member questions before any, any questions on direction happens, but, um, before we uh, end this agenda item to circle back on um, wanting more information. And if we wanna continue, I guess, this this conversation of part two, um, not necessarily committing to an outcome um, at this point, but let me pause and see if there are any other committee questions. I, I don't have questions, I just have comments. So it might make sense to just hold off on that until we circle back, because I think it relates to the you know, how we want to proceed. <laughs> yeah, I just have a question. Uh, is the city aware? I know that I think that building, I think it used to be a furniture building right across uh, Colfax and it covers uh, from Dallas, not quite all the way to Dayton, but I heard that that went up and I know- The front furniture building is what you're referring to, Council Member Medina? Correct. Do you know that that's gone up? For yes, okay. I am aware of that. Just curious. All right, that's all I've got. Okay. Um, <laughs> I wonder. I mean, that's in like this target area. I wonder if the city okay. is uh it has its eyes set on that at all. Um, but okay. So, I'm I'm trying to formulate what I think the question is. I, I think broadly it's it's how do we want to proceed? Um, I think Andrea, you laid out some very tangible next yeah. steps related to um, the uh, the at least two biz not businesses bi buildings that the city owns um, there, and then I think there is like a a larger. Um, Council well, member, you could start there, but did you want to add something, Andrea? Yeah. So if I may, if I were going to pose a question to this group, is council supportive of the current redevelopment strategy in general for this area and utilizing these buildings towards that strategy? Right. It, 
Sorry, working to unmute. Yes, um, I think that's kind of what I was getting at, Andrea. I appreciate the the suggested question. Um, so I guess one one question follow up question before opening it up for for further direction from the council um, in terms of the uh, the direction for the area. Um, are you referring to the uh, urban renewal plan? um for the Fletcher Plaza urban renewal plan or is there another like plan that dictates what kind of from a city perspective what we do in the district no it is the Fletcher Plaza urban renewal plan as amended which happened in 2014. gotcha um mm -hmm. um okay um So I think, I don't know if based on the presentation today, like I would feel um, that I'm prepared to answer that larger question of like the larger scope of the urban renewal plan and then these buildings being used towards that goal. Um, so I guess I was thinking that the question actually more was, um, can we continue this conversation, have a part two? And I I have some thoughts on, I guess I would like to see what the, um, that specifically for those two buildings, what moving forward would look like. Um, yeah, I guess, yeah, so there's that. Um, and then I, I think another thought for me and in asking and requesting this, this agenda item was around, I guess, a larger, a, a deeper way that we might be able to utilize city assets to support kind of the, the arts district, the larger goals of the district. Um, um, I think uh, in the past, um, we've talked about the, the concepts around community wealth building um, and other ways that we might utilize city owned assets to um, create deeper partnerships with community. I, I understand we have current goals and we do partner a lot, um, but I think it's a deeper way than just, you know, leasing a building. It is more around the economic development, working with different like anchor institutions in a community to advance our economic development goals, which as I understand is a big uh, goal of 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 the city um in the area so um yeah th those are my thoughts I, I let me let me pause councilman marcano did you want to add your thoughts now as we like think through developing like what direction we want to provide um or yeah did you want to do that yeah sure um so i think i would definitely like a more detailed discussion on the broader ur urban renewal plan for the area. Um, and I did just want to add with the um, existing assets with that breakdown there, um, from my perspective, we should never, 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 never sell public land. Um, the assets on there, they can be leased out. We can maybe find some uh, arrangement for redevelopment, but never get rid of the land. Um, acquiring and aggregating land is how a lot of cities have successfully redevelop neighborhood centers and city centers without displacing existing residents and businesses, um, you know, allowing right of first return, um, basically for anyone who does need to get uh, displaced temporarily for redevelopment. So uh, from my perspective, putting any of this stuff out on the open market, um, regardless of the process is likely going to just result basically in gentrification um, and the um, displacement permanent displacement of residents, uh, nearby residents and businesses. So yeah, never sell public land. <laughs> in fact, we should be trying to acquire as much as possible. So uh, especially in an area like the Colfax corridor, which is, you know, has such a rich history uh, for our city and still, I think, um, a tremendous amount of potential for the future as well. So that'd be my two cents. So I'd like a deeper discussion on that. Um, and yeah, just any plans uh, that even entertain the idea of getting rid of a uh, city on land, I'm not gonna support. Thank you, Councilmember Marcano. Um, 
Okay, yeah. So I think maybe more clarity on the I think a follow I think two things. A follow up on um the urban renewal plan to to continue this conversation um to be able to answer the do we support the use of these buildings to advance the urban renewal goals? Um so a, a part two on the urban renewal and then um I was interested in seeing what advancing the those recommendations around um, the sale and or the management of those buildings um, would look like. Um, uh, let's see. Um, and then. I guess as part of. For me, um, understanding what what is possible in the area, I'm, I'm wondering if we might be able to engage um, organizations. Like, for example, I, I know of the the Community Wealth Building Network that, um, it, you know, it is their their goal is exactly kind of what I mentioned around um, supporting um anchor institutions um and partnering deeper um with community to achieve economic development goals um so i'd be interested in learning more about what um working with an organization like that could um support our economic development efforts like i i, I just um and we can also talk online to, I guess, narrow the scope a little bit because it does feel a little, um, you know, just work with an organization. But um, yeah, I, I'd like to see um, uh, by our next meeting or whenever we have this conversation, rather, um, some consideration for what a deeper use of um, deeper partnership through these buildings could be with the the surrounding community, if that makes sense. So um, let me pause Andrea <laughs> and see if if that like, I guess thought exercise makes sense and is clear to you. Um, yeah, we can um, provide you the 2014 amendment to the plan. So I gave you the original one so that you would understand that, you know, the redevelopment goals of this have been looked at and have been done with the community. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we're 20, 20 years into this. So um, yeah, we can we can update that and we can talk specifically about that. We can explore those processes. I truly appreciate council member Marcano's comments about, you know, I mean, that's solid direction um, that we're looking for, which says we'll go this way rather than that way, right? In terms of, you know, not getting rid of the assets. And it does give us a little more flexibility. So I still, um, and I believe that we could put together um, some discussion of what we specifically would like to do. We can talk about what we're specifically trying to achieve for each of the buildings, because it's not just, um, you know, it's not just saying, well, we want, you know, an arts district, these buildings, you know, it, there is a significant amount, particularly when we're dealing with like art space, there's a significant amount of subsidy that's required to run art space generally. Um, um, yeah, so I mean, obviously council member Marcano has some strong opinions, but um, is it necessarily the, the whole, um, and, and maybe um, is, you know, things change, who knows? I don't know. Um, and not that I'm necessarily advocating for that. Um, I just, I don't want to not explore the full breadth of options. Like I, I tend to agree with you, council member Marcano, frankly, um, but I, I think for the sake of good process, like I guess being open to 
what our options are is kind of like my mindset um, for for part two of the conversation. Um, and I hear you, Andrea, like that's probably, <laughs> you know, it, it's clear when when council's like, no, I want this and not this. Um, I don't know if I've ever come to you with a straight a, an easy uh, request. So just to be true to our relationship thus far, <laughs> um, I, I kind of feel like um, yeah, and, and I, I know we're over time, so I don't want to belabor the point, but I, I think is that enough direction for us to have a follow up conversation um, with you, me, maybe and whomever else needs to be there on kind of what the part two looks like, because I don't fully think it's just an update on the urban renewal plan. Frankly, I think we want to know about the most recent updates. Uh, we want to know what the sale and management could look like. I want to know, and I think we had some alignment last meeting um, around like deeper relationships via like a, a community wealth building mindset was also of interest to the committee as well. Um, so if you're, uh, let me, if that's good enough direction, um, I will ask for a support from our two council members to see if um, you will, uh, if you're interested in a part two conversation, exploring kind of those avenues. Yeah, definitely. I'm good. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. All righty. Um, let me do a time check. How are you all on time, uh, Ruben and uh, Juan? I've got a one o'clock. Uh, I do want to get lunch before then, but I <laughs> so I don't know how how long the next two are going to take. But I'm okay for the time being. I'm good. Um, go ahead, uh, Councilmember Medina. I'm good. Uh, Jessica, what are you what are you thinking, um, time wise, or whomever is the the speakers for the next two agenda items? Like, um, how much time do we need? I, um, so we have the update on the emergency rental assistance. Um, I can try and do my presentation in about 5 minutes and, um, hopefully have about 5 minutes for questions. The, the group okay. have. and then Councilman Mario, the other item um, is just related to some updates um, around homelessness and that information's in the backup. So, um. You know, that one can either be super brief or you all could just refer to the backup and then let us know okay. if there's any questions. Gotcha. All right. Um, yeah, let's work through Alicia, the next agenda item. And then for the last one, if we have any questions, feel free to ask. If not, um, refer to to the to the backup. Sounds good. Um all right. Are you able to see my presentation? Yes. Yes, but it's not in like a full presentation mode yet. All right. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Uh, great. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is just a quick update on the emergency rental assistance uh, program that we have been administering for um, a little over a year, a couple years now. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, um, this is assistance that is being provided to individuals who are having some sort of hardship paying their rent, um, specifically um, hardship related to co for COVID reasons or a loss of um, income due to COVID. Um, there's, there are some basic requirements such as the 80% area median income. Um, and um, again, it has to be related to, to COVID. There, uh, the lease has to be um, in place and the property has to be in the city of Aurora. Um, also, we ensure that applicants disclose if they have funding or they have received funding from any other area, such as um, the Department of Local Affairs um, can provide them funding. Um, um, other counties, such as um, Adams and Arapaho, and um, we just make sure that we're not uh, that they're not double dipping, so they're not getting double the assistance for um, for the rent payments. So that's just a little quick background on uh, rent assistance. Um, so far, um, we have done two rounds. So emergency emergency rental assistance one and two. Um, through the first round, we distrib di distributed about 9.5 million in assistance and process about 1,100 applications. Um, all of the funding for uh, the first phase has been spent. 
Um, on the second uh, round or ERA two, we received about 4.6 million um, and uh, process about 826 applications. We have stopped taking applications because um, the funding is running out and throughout the state, other organizations and agencies are also facing out of the rental assistance program. Um, some more stats on just the funding. I am not going to spend a whole lot of time here, obviously, due to timing, um, but we have other programs and provided assistance um, overall throughout the different programs that we have um, administered or being a part of um, about 16 million in assistance for um, rent um, throughout the city of Aurora. Specifically for the emergency rental assistance, which is what this presentation is on, um, we have administered about $14.7 million in rent assistance. Um, and in, the, in regards to the current status, um, we, uh, like I said earlier, we have stopped taking applications um, because we are beginning to run out of funding. Um, also, we've had some uh, staff turnover and we're down to 1 person processing those applications. We have um, about 50 applications that are still pending um, uh, review. And so we're working through those. We forecast that we will process all of those applications um, throughout the month of September and most, if not all of the funding that we have remaining will be spent. Um, we processed just in July alone, we processed over 150 applications um, and there may be a duplication of funding resources, not to individuals, but funding resources throughout the state because the Department of Local Affairs is also providing that funding. Um, and then we're also looking at administering a new program for mortgage payment assistance. Um, that is also that would also focus on individuals that are having some sort of hardship due to COVID. Um, this would be focusing on another area in the community that is very vulnerable. Um, we're trying to prevent foreclosures really with this program. Um, and so we need to really look at the resources that we have and figure out how to best uh, how to best utilize them to prevent those foreclosures from happening in the community. Um, and because there are other um, organizations in the state that are, that are offering this assistance, um, it makes sense that we face out of the program as well. Other concerns and reasons why we um, have stopped administering um, or are uh, facing out of administering the rental assistance is that the applications um, that we're receiving are not necessarily COVID related or the loss of income is not necessarily COVID related. Um, we have had we have some concerns about the program in integrity because we are seeing a spike on um, applications that are fraudulent or we are getting documents that are um, uh, uh, Fake, just fake documents that that don't uh, don't really represent the truth about the case, um, and so that takes it takes more time for our staff to review those applications, and um, we already have limited staff, so it's it's another risk. Uh, we're trying to protect the integrity of the program and make sure that the funds are placed in the hands of the people that actually need it. Um, Uh, last but not least, um, like I explained briefly um, at the beginning of the presentation, we do have another program that's coming on board. I don't have all of the details just yet, um, but is the Emer Emergency Mortgage Assistance Program. Uh, we have been awarded $1.75 million um, for this program. We are wrapping up the agreements in the next couple of weeks and we'll receive training on administering the program, uh, hopefully by the end of this month, September, um, but hopefully no later than mid October. Um, we have made some updates on our website just to let the community know um, that we are no longer taking applications and we're focusing on the applications that we currently have. Um, we are also having conversations with the Department of Local Affairs and other counties to make sure that we have a plan should people still need access to this assistance. 
And then we are also wrapping up the reporting. We have done the reporting for all of the uh, first phase of rental assistance. Um, and we are on the end or towards the end of reporting for rental assistance for the second phase of rental assistance as we wrap up the remaining applications. Um, and that is all I have. And sorry, I try to go through it quickly. So, um, if there's anything that you need clarification on, uh, please let me know. You did that great. Thank you, Alicia. Uh, any questions? Yeah, Councilor Murillo. All right. Oh, all right. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the presentation, Alicia. Um, so I understand that the COVID related um, rental assistance program um, is going away. Um, I understand that we don't really have the funding to maintain this uh, in the long term. Um, but my concern is that Aurora has been um, long before COVID the eviction capital of Colorado. And I think we're uh, from the data I saw from eviction lab, we were, I think, 32nd in the entire country. Uh, and that was back when we were the 54th largest city and now we're the 50th. So this is something that's going to remain an issue in our community. Um, and I'm just, you know, kind of concerned that we're going to literally be leaving people out in the cold here over the next few months. So do we have any plan? Are you aware of the state um, maybe being willing to pick up any of the slack? Because, um, you know, I understand the COVID related or direct COVID related, um, you know, financial emergencies and evictions are beginning to narrow down, but there's still the ongoing, you know, affordability crisis that we have um, in the city. Yeah, and we're, um, we are having conversations with, um, both Arapaho County, Adams County, and the Department of Local Affairs. Um, it is my understanding through conversations with DOLA that they still have um, over $40 million in funding that they have to administer. Um, so I just want to be clear, it, it, it's not, not all of the funding or assistance is going away completely. Um, we are just trying to address the, the um, the services that we can provide with the staff that we currently have. Mm -hmm. um, and so it makes sense that since there's still um, other assistance available out th throughout the state, um, that we uh, look at foreclosures and trying to prevent some of those foreclosures as um, those are spiking up in the city as well. Okay. Councilmember Marcano, we still have our flex fund. So that is funded uh, with marijuana funds. And so that continues not doesn't have to be COVID related um, and that that still continues on and um, work well with our partners um, to work folks. So that's eviction prevention or down payment assistance and other sort of um, creative ways that we can assist people when they're either in crisis or needing a little bit of help. Okay, great. So what I'm hearing from you all then is that we're gonna do what we can to keep people in the house even though this is going away. All right, good, thank you. questions? No, I'm good. Thank you. All righty. Thank you very much. Um, we can wrap this agenda item up. Um, looks like we are at the end of our agenda. Any community member updates? All righty. I believe we are good to adjourn. Uh, our next meeting will be in a month, and that date is <laughs> um, on the 6th. Does that uh, work for, so work for you, Council Member uh, Marcano and Medina? Yep. Yes. Alrighty, I will, we'll see you all in a month. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks, y'all. Take care. Bye. Bye.